الحمد للہ وقفا و صلاۃ وسلم علی عباد الدین اصطفا خصوصاً علی افدلہم و خاتم النبیین محمد الامین و علی علیہ و صحبہ اجمعین و بعد وی گریٹ یو فرام اے لٹل ولیج اپ ان دا ماؤنٹینس بومی لینگیٹ آؤٹ سائڈ آف دا انڈونیشین ٹاؤن اور سٹی of yogya karta and we greet you with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wherever you are in the world as we seek to address you tonight on the subject of relation between the shia and the sunni we know in consequence of our study of islamic eschatology or ilm akhiru zaman we know that the dajjal has a master plan at work and he's pursuing that master plan of trying to foment and to ignite Shia Sunni civil war in the world of Islam. Such a civil war has not as yet occurred. They tried it <coughs> when Saddam Hussein launched his aggressive attack on Iran, aggression, pure aggression, on behalf of the Zionists. because Saddam Hussein was their blue-eyed boy. The war with Iran, which lasted for eight years, did not succeed in igniting Sunni-Shia civil war in the house of Islam. No, it did not. Allah did not allow it to happen. And then they launched yes, another attack in the armed insurrection in Syria. hoping that that armed insurrection in Syria would ignite Sunni-Shia civil war. It has been now three years since they launched that armed insurrection in Syria, and they have not as yet succeeded. And now it seems as though the last card that they have to play is a card called ISIS. This bogus jihad being launched in northern Iraq and northern Syria, by these people who say they're going to reclaim the Khilafah or the Caliphate. Doing it, of course, with Zionist money, doing it with Zionist weapons, doing it with Zionist training. And of course, Turkey is a member state of NATO. And all of us know that NATO is the military arm of the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance. Will they succeed with ISIS? in igniting Sunni-Shia civil war in the world of Islam? I do not know. But I have a duty to do all that I can possibly do to ensure that it does not happen. One of the things that can be done is to bring some theoretical analysis to the Shia-Sunni divide in Islam, to try to bring some clarity of thought to the subject. and in the process to try to build a bridge between the Sunni and the Shia to establish a common front, to establish Shia-Sunni solidarity in facing a common enemy, those who want to eventually rule the world from Jerusalem by the hook or by the crook, but it's always by the crook. How do we bridge the guy, the divide between the Shia and the Sunni. All that we want to do in this presentation is to deliver a warning, the mother of all warnings to the Sunni, who are now beating their drums and uh, blasting their trumpets, declaring that the Shia are kuffar. Those Sunni, who are dancing to every tune that the Dajjal plays should listen to this warning. And it is delivered as part of a theoretical presentation with no boxing gloves on my hands. No. How does a community become kuffar when they say of themselves that they are Muslim? There is a process. 
and those who dance to Dajjal's tunes should know what is the process. The process is that a scholar, not a schoolboy, a scholar of a sufficient rank and standing in the world of Islamic scholarship must deliver a fatwa or a legal opinion. And that legal opinion is this delivered with all the arguments which support the position, declaring that a particular group of people are, Mus are no longer Muslim, they are kuffar. This fatwa of kufr has to be established has to be pronounced. <coughs> it has to be reduced to writing and circulated amongst the scholars. When that is done, then the next part of the process is to achieve ijma or consensus. Consensus, first of all, amongst those who are qualified to offer an opinion on the subject. People of knowledge, not schoolboys. We have never had ijma'a in this ummah that the Shia are kuffar. We have had um, ijma'a that the Qadianis, the supporters and followers of Mirza Ghulam, Ahmad, the false messiah, they, they are kuffar. There is ijma'a on that. But there has never been ijma'a that the Shia are kuffar. Where has reason gone? Where has logic gone? Where has elementary common sense gone? If such a fatwa had been delivered, and if there had been ijma'a of the ummah, that the Shia are no longer Muslim, they are kuffar, then how do you explain that the Shia have never been stopped from performing the Hajj? There have never been demonstrations arguing that the Shia should not be allowed to perform the Hajj. Up to this miserable day, up to this day, miserable because of the drum beating of these people who are saying that the Shia are kuffar. If you say of a Muslim that he is kafir, and he is not kafir, you become kafir, said the Prophet ﷺ. You become a kafir. So I want to deliver the mother of all warnings to those Sunnis who are beating the drums of war against the Shia to those Sunnis who are dancing to Dajjal's tunes. Why? Because Dajjal wants to ignite Sunni-Shia civil war in the world of Islam at this time, but they cannot understand that. They have eyes and yet cannot see. They have ears and yet cannot hear. They have hearts and yet do not understand. Allah says of such people, Ula'ika kal an'am, they are just like cattle. They're just like cattle, balhumadal, rather they're more misguided than cattle. My words are strong. My words are bitter. Yes, I know, but I have to speak like this because the house of Islam is threatened now with civil war. And so I say to them, come on and deliver the fatwa. Get a scholar of some eminence to deliver the fatwa. Let us see the fatwa. Bring it forward. And then let us see whether you can get Ijma'al Ummah on that bogus fatwa. Bogus because it's a long time now since the Shias have been here. It's more than a thousand years now. You had a long time to give that fatwa. Having spoken those words very sternly to those Sunni who are beating the drums of war, particularly in the Arab world, against the Shia. It is now time for us to deliver a warning to the Shia as well. We have recognized the revolution in Iran to have been a positive development because Imam Khomeini, rahimahullah, reached out to the Sunni world and thought to establish Shia-Sunni solidarity. And the revolutionary government in Iran has continuously maintained that policy of seeking to preserve, build and preserve Sunni-Shia solidarity. But we don't know what tomorrow holds in store for Iran. 
We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow in Iran, so it's time for us to deliver a gentle warning now. And that is that no one can defer at all that the supreme authority in Islam is the Quran. It is the Quran and the Quran alone which has absolute authority in Islam. And everything else beside the Quran must submit to the Quran. And hence the hadith are subsidiary to the Quran. If a hadith is in harmony with the Quran, then it joins the Quran in building the world of knowledge. If a hadith is not in harmony in the Quran, but not in conflict with the Quran, then that hadith is still acceptable, but at a lower status. And if a hadith is in conflict with the Quran, then we say it is the Quran which must prevail. Has anyone challenged this? Is this methodology cap capable of being challenged? No. It makes sense. It is the truth. And that is that the Quran is the absolute authority in Islam. And no hadith has the status of the Quran. And so you cannot build a, the a theory. You cannot believe, build a, be a belief system in Islam based on hadith. It has to be built on the Qur'an. And the hadith are to be used to support the Qur'an. Does the Qur'an deliver in language which is plain and clear? Does the Qur'an deliver that which supports the theory of the imamat? That the leadership of the Ummah of Muhammad upon his death was a leadership divinely decreed to have been that of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Does the Qur'an support that? Does the Qur'an support the belief that succession to leadership by divine decree is restricted to the house of the Prophet Does the Qur'an support that in language which is plain and clear? You cannot interpret the Qur'an to build a belief system. No! The Qur'an has ayat which are muhkamat and ayat which are mutashabihat. But the Qur'an declares about the ayat muhkamat that they are ummul kitab. So belief systems have to come out of ummul kitab from the muhkamat, not from the mutashabihat. So you do not interpret a verse of the Qur'an to come and convince me that the Qur'an has appointed to Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu as the successor of the Prophet No. If you cannot use the Qur'an to demonstrate plainly and clearly the theory of the imamat, that the leadership of the Ummah alayhi salatu wasalam, is divinely decreed to be from Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and restricted to the house of the Prophet then you are shaky, you are on shaky foundations. You do not divide yourself from the Sunni over this issue. No. The Quran must unite us, not divide us. And do not use the hadith to create a new sect. And so we urge you never, never, never to say of Abu Bakr Siddiq or Umar Farooq or Uthman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhum that they were usurpers. You have no authority to speak such language from the Quran. If we are able to agree on these two issues, that a fatwa of kufr has to achieve ijma'a before a people can be cleared, recognized to be kufar, and that has never happened in the case of the Shia. And if we can agree on this second point, that the Qur'an is the only absolute authority in Islam, the only one, and that the hadith are there to support the Qur'an and to submit to the Qur'an and to be subservient to the Qur'an, they do not have equal status with the Qur'an. 
And if we can further recognize that the Quran does not provide a foundation for this theory of the imamah, then we know that it is possible for us to build a bridge between the Shia and the Sunni, a bridge with integrity in it, that the Shia and the Sunni can hold, both hold forth, hold fast to the Quran, and the Quran can unite us, and the enemies can grind their teeth in frustration. If you have a better theory than this, if you have a better approach than this for building Shia Sunni solidarity, please come forward and give voice to it and articulate it. And I love to hear it. This is my humble contribution at this critical moment in the House of Islam. A humble contribution for bridging the divide, the Sunni Shia divide for building Sunni-Shia solidarity to face the common Zionist enemy, to building Shia-Sunni solidarity in order to prevent Dajjal from achieving his master plan of igniting Shia-Sunni civil war in the world of Islam. Before I end, need I remind you? that there's only one Muslim country in the world today which is a nuclear power, and that's Pakistan. Need I remind you that, that, that Israel cannot rule the world? No, nope. so long as any Muslim country has nuclear weapons. Need I remind you that the plan is that Pakistan must be denuclearized de by the hook or by the crook? If they do not want to wage a nuclear war with Pakistan, then how, do they, how will they succeed? The answer is they've got to attack from Pakistan from inside and get Pakistan to break up from civil war. And need I remind you that if our enemies succeed in igniting Shia Sunni civil war in the house of Islam, that's goodbye to Pakistan. Pakistan will not survive. You don't need a PhD to understand that. I hope these words of mine will reach the Shia and the Sunni, and that these words of mine may germinate. And tomorrow we'll have fresh thought on how we can bridge the Shia-Sunni divide in the world of Islam and build solidarity against the common common enemy enemy rabbana taqabbal minna innaka antas samiul alim wa tub alayna ya mawlana innaka antat tawwabur rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin